Hi everyone, my name is Nadir Akhtar. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Blockchain Berkeley. And today I'm going to be giving the lecture on cryptocurrency mining, which, as you know, involves the proof of work consensus. So the biggest question that I want to ask today, why do we do things? Why do you attend school? Why do you want a job? Why did you choose your major? Why do you pet dogs? Right? It all comes down to the same central idea. Profit. Can everyone see that? No? I'll make it a little bigger. Profit, all right? So the question is, what is profit? Does anyone have an idea of what profit is? Anyone? Yeah. Right, precisely. Profit is the difference of reward minus cost. Can everyone see that? I'll underline it if you can't. So the question about why we mine is answered by the fact that we want profits. If the reward is greater than the cost, we get money. So profit equals reward minus cost. This is the central theme for today's lecture. So keep this in mind. The question then comes down to what exactly mining is. Right, we know, we've heard mining, but the question is what a miner actually does. So there are six essential steps that come down to mining. Right? So a Bitcoin miner must first download the entire Bitcoin blockchain onto their device. So they have to download all 100 gigabytes of the blockchain all the way from the Genesis block up till now. Once they've downloaded all that information, they have to verify incoming transactions in real time by checking the signatures and by validating the existence of valid bitcoins. From there, they'll, compile these, they'll uh, compile these transactions and create a block that's made up of valid transactions. They'll hash all these transactions using the Merkle tree and Merkle root scheme, and then they'll find a valid nonce to create a valid block header. That's where the mining part comes in. You consecutively try again and again until you find a valid nonce that allows you to create a block header that is below some target difficulty. Then you're going to hope that your block is accepted by other nodes and hasn't been defeated by some other block that was propagated before yours and accepted before yours. And then if all goes according to plan and you manage to get a block onto the blockchain, you make profits in the form of a block reward. Does anyone have any questions? So the block difficulty can be related to a target. Right, so Imagine that you're trying to throw darts while blindfolded at this target. You have no idea of knowing where the darts are going. All you know is that you want to get a dart inside that little circle. And if you get a dart inside there, you make profits. So the block difficulty is essentially like a little target inside a target. And the faster you throw darts, the more likely you are to hit that center circle. Keep in mind that we don't know what a certain nonce is going to produce. We can't choose nonces that are going to get us within a certain target because we have no way of predicting what nonce is going to give us what kind of hash. So all we can do is try to produce more hashes per second, or with the analogy of this target, throw more darts per second. So as the difficulty is related to this target, if people get faster at throwing darts, if everyone gets better at hitting that green circle, that green circle is going to diminish, it's going to decrease in size. So the difficulty is inversely proportional to that green ring size. So as everyone gets better in mining, as people develop better hardware, as there is a larger hash rate per second on average, then that green circle needs to get smaller so that the puzzle isn't too easy. So the puzzle prereqs for a hash puzzle, well, a hash puzzle is first and foremost the requirement to find a nonce that satisfies the inequality that was in the lower left region behind the, beneath the target, which is restated here, that you take a hash of the nonce, concatenated with the previous hash, concatenated with the Merkle roots, and find something that is beneath the target difficulty. So these hash puzzles need to be computationally difficult. Right? If finding the proof of work requires little work, then there's no point in having this puzzle because it's no longer a puzzle. Anyone can validate the block easily because it takes no computational, it takes very little relative computational power. So that's why in the analogy, we blindfold the dart throwers. If everyone's able to see exactly where that little target is, then it's much easier than if you don't know where you're aiming for. And the second uh, requirement is that it has a variable cost. Essentially, as everyone gets better at doing the puzzle, you need to be able to make the puzzle more difficult. And third, it needs to be easy to verify that the puzzle has been solved. So 
there should not be any kind of central authority that needs to verify whether a nonce is valid. Instead, other miners need to be able to use that nonce, rehash it, and verify that it's in fact valid. So if we look back to that analogy of a dartboard and darts, if darts fell out of, the, of this dartboard, then the question is how would you verify that the dart managed to hit that central target? You could have a camera, but then someone could claim that someone's messing with the footage of the camera. So the difficulty adjustment equation is that the difficulty is going to equal the previous difficulty times two weeks divided by the time to mine the previous 2016 blocks. This is because it should take exactly two weeks to mine 2016 blocks if each block takes 10 minutes to mine. All right, so a quick sanity check. Imagine that your difficulty is 10 and it takes two weeks to mine 2016 blocks. If that's the case, what is our new difficulty going to be equal to? Show of hands. Right. If the time it takes to mine 2016 blocks is exactly equal to two weeks, then that means our new difficulty is going to be, sorry? Yes, it'll still be 10. And the reason for that is because our difficulty doesn't need to change if everyone's mining at around what we want our block production rate to be. Now, imagine that the time to mine takes one week instead. So, if we're mining 2016 blocks twice as fast, what is the new difficulty going to become? 20. Exactly. And if the time to mine takes four weeks, or people are now half as slow? Five. Precisely. So, the difficulty is inversely proportional to the time to mine. So, how to profit from mining? So, the mining reward is going to be equal to the block reward plus the transaction fees and the mining cost is going to be equal to the hardware cost plus the operation cost. So if the mining reward is greater than the mining cost, the miner is going to get profit, which is the whole goal of mining. So to first take a look at block reward, the block reward is essentially a reward that every miner receives once they confirm a valid block. So a miner receives around 12.5 Bitcoin currently for every block that they're able to mine. So there is a certain coin-based transaction in which a miner can send the block reward to themselves. And that is the incentive for honest behavior. Right. So this block reward halves every 21 or 210,000 blocks. As you can see, it originally started off at 50, went down to 25, and now it's currently at 12.5. This means that there's a finite amount of Bitcoin that's ever going to exist in the world, because as the block reward decreases, the amount of Bitcoin that's produced is also going to decrease because the only way that new Bitcoin is added is through the block reward. So, yes? Is there a reason why we set like 200 to 210,000 like about every two years as opposed to have it continuously decrease the value? All right. Because we have every two years. So his question was why do we have it every two years as opposed to a continuous, uh, like, as opposed to having the block reward decrease after every mine block? The reason for that, I think, is just for ease. Otherwise, you have to have some sort of a more complex way of figuring out what the block reward is supposed to be after every block. So I think it's easier for everyone if it's a standard number for each block reward rather than a slow uh, decrementing reward. Yeah. How will minus be incentivized on this Right. So that's a very good question. I'm going to answer that later, so hold on to that thought. His question was, how are miners going to be incentivized to mine after the block reward has diminished to zero? And as you can remember from the equation, right, the profit, if it's equal to block reward plus transaction fees, and there's no block reward, it all has to come from transaction fees, which I will talk about in, in a very short amount of time. So as for the existence of the block reward, why does it exist? So we know that people do things for profits, as we've established before. and we know that a higher incentive for honesty is going to lead to a more secure network. Right? If people are going to get profit out of being honest, they help to secure the network. And we also know that because we have pseudonymous users, we can't track or punish people if they do something wrong, if we catch them you know, doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. So if we can't punish dishonest behavior, the only logical choice is to reward those who are honestly mining blocks and securing the network. So proof of work ensures that people who are verifying transactions are dedicated to the network. Right? They're willing to spend US money 
on electricity, on hardware, just to produce, you know, just to earn Bitcoin and to secure the network, which by itself does not have value unless there is a whole community of people who believe that it does indeed have value. So the second way you get reward for mining is through the transaction fees. Okay. So the transaction fees are set by the transaction creator. So this is technically voluntary, but it's practically necessary if you want your transaction to get confirmed. Now, so what you would do is have a certain input and a certain output, and that difference is going to be equal to the transaction fee. And that is an extra amount of income that miners make on top of the block reward. The reason that they'll confirm transactions with higher transaction fees, it's very straightforward. If you want more profits, you want more Bitcoin, then the people who say that they're going to give you, for example, a dollar if you confirm the transaction are, is a transaction you want to confirm faster than people who say they'll give you 10 cents. Right? So for example, if you set no transaction fee, it's possible that it'll take years. It might not even ever get confirmed if you have a transaction fee of zero because miners just aren't incentivized to confirm your transaction. So, as previously noted, yes, your question? Wouldn't that effectively mean there would be expensive being the same transaction and you could apply the same calculation that we have now with mining to just transaction fees? Sorry, can you rephrase your question? That, I mean, doesn't it become very expensive for the people that want to send to mine if all the income that some miners get comes from transaction fees? Yes, that, so what he's asking or what he's proposing is that it'll get very expensive for people who want to send Bitcoin if the transaction fees are the only reward that the miners get. And yes, that is very true. That's one thing that people worry about. The transaction fees are going to get really high once the block reward approaches zero. So that's a very good observation. That we don't know exactly how transaction fees are going to change as the block reward diminishes. But we can see obviously that it is increasing. So now to look at the mining cost. First and foremost is the hardware cost in the hardware that you use to produce hashes. So as you can see here, right, we started off with CPUs, moved on to GPUs, and then we started using ASICs, which are more and more specialized forms of mining. So CPU mining. This was the original form of mining. This is what Satoshi used, for example. So let's take a good look at the pseudocode. So there is some target that's set based on the difficulty and some coin-based nonce, which is initialized at zero. So essentially what they do is they create a header using the transactions and the coin-based nonce, and for a certain header nonce initialized at zero, all the way up to 256 bits, they increment that header nonce, and if that header nonce produces a valid block, then you break out of the loop. Otherwise, you keep producing header nonces, and if that doesn't work, then you increment the coin-based nonce in the coin-based transaction. So you'll notice that SHA-256 is called twice. And something that's really interesting is that very recently, there was the announcement by Google of the SHA-1 collision. How many people are familiar with that news about the SHA-1 collision? Right. So to reiterate, a collision is when two inputs map to the same output. And that's an issue because a hash is supposed to distinguish a certain input from another input. So if we have two inputs that map to the same output, then you're able to do things like birthday attacks, which are essentially using a different input to mimic the output of another hash. So for this reason, the people who are, when they were deciding how to implement this hash function, they used SHA-256 twice, which is denoted as SHA-256 function squared. So this is supposed to make it more resistant to birthday attacks. Like if you were to map all the, out, all the inputs to certain outputs, once you use the SHA-256 function again, then you've destroyed that, essentially, that mapping because now you have to map those new outputs to another set of outputs through the hash function again. So while there's not necessarily a proven risk that SHA-256 would be vulnerable to the same kind of vulnerabilities as SHA-1, it was still a precaution taken to ensure that such birthday attacks cannot be um, conducted. And if you're interested, there is a link down there or we can explain later in lecture, if anyone has any questions. So after CPU mining was GPU mining. GPUs are able to process more information. Right? They're an order, uh, order of magnitude faster than CPUs when it comes to mining. But this also implies that they're going to consume more energy and produce more heat. They were most common around five years ago. And they're, vi they're currently viable for mining Zcash. 
Zcash is an anonymous currency which was recently produced which uses a different kind of algorithm called Equihash and currently they claim that Zcash will never be dominated by ASICs, the specialized hardware, which I'll talk about very soon. But we don't know necessarily that even this new algorithm or this different hash algorithm that they claim can't be dominated by specialized hardware is actually going to be proven in the future. So some disadvantages for GPUs are that they have many components that are not used for, ha or for hashing. For example, floating point units are not necessary for mining. And in addition, they're not meant to be run in farms side by side. FPGA mining, this was uh, in reference to field programmable gate arrays. This was the first step towards Bitcoin specific hardware. So while this did not do only SHA-256, it was primarily made to do Bitcoin mining. So this is a trade-off between dedicated hardware and general purpose hardware. And the reason that people still kept this trade-off is because if Bitcoin were to fail, then all your hardware would essentially go to scrap if all it can do is SHA-256. But if Bitcoin rises incredibly in profits, then you realize that you want to be able to have a higher hash rate to get more Bitcoin and therefore get more profits. And then ASICs are the final step of Bitcoin-specific hardware. They're application-specific integrated circuits. So ASICs can be designed to do nothing but SHA-256. So they can't do anything else, but they do it better than all the other technology out there. They strip out all the unnecessary components, and, it, it, and this technology is optimized for doing this hash function. So ASICs have a huge variety with a great number of trade-offs. Right, so for an ASIC, you can choose between a lower base cost or lower electricity usage. You can choose between a compact device or a higher hash rate. And in addition, ASICs uh, require a lot of large upfront capital to get them at what would be a profit for you. So you'd have to buy in the range of the thousands in order to make a, a, a reasonable profit from using ASICs. So you notice that Antminer S9, which is the most powerful ASIC on the market, is around $3,000. It can produce 14 terahashes per second, but it will still take 4.28 years for it to produce a block on its own. I thought I saw it, yes. So, do you need a combination of ASICs to make a process Yes, so essentially what you'd want to do is use multiple ASICs so that you can produce more hashes per second from your local mining rig. The thing is that companies that produce ASICs often want a large amount, they want you to buy in the thousands so that they can make a reasonable amount of profits and they sell it to you at a cheaper cost than if you were to buy one individually. Individually, So, so there are like mining setups in China, in Europe that are just dedicated to Bitcoin mining. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, I believe that, yeah, they would distribute the work, uh, if you're familiar with mining pools, the way they distribute work is that they have everyone work on different subsets of nonces that are possible, and similarly, you'd have different ASICs working on different, different parts of the problem, so that, you know, essentially just splitting up your computing resources. Do you happen to know how big these problems are right now? I don't know how fast they are. I know that there is a, uh, there's one set up in China. There's one person, I forgot his name, but essentially in China there's 20% of the global hash rate, for example. There's one, I believe there's one uh, specific mining setup that you know has 20% of the global hash rate. So I don't know how many ASICs or how much technology it took to produce that amount of uh, hash rate, but they can get very substantial. I'll give you his name after class if you're interested. So after hardware cost, the other cost is the operation cost, right? Using the hardware that, you are, that you've bought. So we know that everything comes down to energy in the end, right? All the energy is put into producing the hardware, all the energy is put into using the hardware, and all the energy is put into maintaining the hardware. So the embodied energy is referred to 
as what is used in making the hardware, all the way from the, you know, the very basic chips and uh, designs that are put into making the hardware that you buy, that you spend $3,000 on. From there, it takes electricity to power the hardware, and from there, you have to make sure that you cool your hardware so that you don't accidentally let it fry itself and then waste your $3,000 investment. So we see an issue very quickly that all this energy is transformed merely into heat. So a lot of people are saying that this is wasteful. So they're trying to come up with alternatives for letting this energy go to waste. So because all this energy turns to heat, people have actually invented what is known as the data furnace approach. And the data furnace approach is to use your hardware as a literal heater. So when they want heat, they'll you know, turn on the mining rig and they'll use that as a way of producing heat it's essentially turning their electricity into both money and into a way for keeping themselves away from the cold. However, this raises some interesting questions. What would happen if everyone in America, for example, were to stop using their mining rigs during the summer? What would happen to the global hash rate? If people were to only use their rigs when it was hot and to stop using it during hot days, it's interesting to consider what might happen to you know, Bitcoin mining in general. So the question is, what else can we do with proof of work in order to make it more useful? So this is where some innovative proof of work ideas come in. So first, we'll take a look at ASIC resistance, which is the idea that we want to keep ASICs out of the community. Satoshi himself said, one CPU, one vote. So essentially, people want to follow that philosophy and produce ASIC resistant puzzles. Another idea is use, uh, proof of useful work where you have to solve a puzzle that is meaningful to the community in order to verify instead of using SHA-256. Another one is proof of storage, where you save some valuable, public, important file on your computer and you use proof of work to verify that you've properly saved it. Another concept is merge mining, which involves altcoins that fork off of Bitcoin and essentially helping them secure their own network. And if we have time in the end, we'll go over SHA-256. So first and foremost, let's take a refresher. Let's look at some proof-of-work puzzle requirements. So they need to be quick to verify. If someone says they've solved it, it shouldn't be hard to tell whether or not they've solved it. It needs to be proportional to the computational power. Right? The more computational power you have, the more resources you expend, the more likely you should be to get a reward. And it needs to be progress-free. If someone's been mapping a table to solve your puzzle, then there's an issue. So Bitcoin's puzzle, for example, is a partial hash pre-image puzzle. So this means that it does not matter what follows the prerequisite number of zeros. Right? If it's a long string of Fs or As or uh, some other character, then miners won't care. They're just looking for a header that meets the prerequisite number of zeros. So ASIC resistance, pros and cons. So some pros for ASIC resistance are that ASICs currently dominate the network and they suppress regular people who want to mine. So an increase in democracy and a decrease in centralization would allegedly come out of ASIC resistance because now you don't have certain people who have all of the, who have like 20% of the mining power and you're left with a CPU that takes 3 million years to mine a block. Some of the cons of ASIC resistance, however, are that people who buy ASICs are buying hardware that can only support or supposedly attack the Bitcoin network. But the thing is that once you've you or once Bitcoin is gone, that hardware becomes obsolete. So if Bitcoin if you use your technology to attack Bitcoin, then that hardware becomes worthless because no one else needs you to do SHA-256 for them. So a crash in the exchange rate would essentially lead to a loss of the value of your hardware. Now there's one note that if an attacker were to rent out computational power and point that computational power in such a way that they could attack the network, then they would be able to perform the attack without owning the hardware and thus losing the investment. So a way to provide ASIC resistance, theoretically, is through a memory hard puzzle. So memory hard means that it requires a large amount of memory instead of computational power. And memory bound means that the memory is what bottlenecks the computational time. So memory hard puzzles, as you can see, they deter ASICs because ASICs are meant to increase your computational power. But if the memory is what the issue is, then the computational power is not what you want to optimize. It's the memory. However, we see that memory performance, it, its increases are much slower than the computational power 
increases. So, for example, if you want to purchase a certain amount of memory, that usually scales more linearly than computational power, which might not necessarily, which as we've said before, is cheaper when you buy in bulk for ASICs by the thousands. So the cost of solving the puzzle, it decreases much slower as you try to uh, get more profit. So if your cost is increasing with your profits, or if your cost is increasing with your revenue, then the profit is staying about the same. So let's go ahead and take a look at script. So script is a hash function and the mining puzzle is the same partial pre-image, partial hash pre-image puzzle, but the difference is that it's a memory hard puzzle. Right, this is used by Litecoin and by Dogecoin. So the question is whether or not it's obviously ace resistant, because if it's not, then its whole philosophy is worthless. So there's two main stages. First, they fill a buffer with some interdependent data. Right, so a buffer of size n is generated, and then they access that data in a pseudo-random way. As you can see, a random, a random value from this array is accessed and you have to find what that value is. So it's obviously requiring a lot of memory because you access those values in a random way. So the issue is that it also takes that same amount of memory to verify whether or not you have found a valid solution. So that goes against one of the basic tenets that it needs to be easy to verify even if it takes a long time to mine. And in addition, an ASIC was actually developed for this. That means it's not resistant. So again, we can see that this is not ASIC resistant. So other ideas were to use X11 or X13. This idea is that you chain together 11 or 13 different hash functions. And that way, you can't have a, an ASIC that does one hash function. It has to be able to do all 11 or all 13. So this is used by Dash, for example. And it's significantly harder to design an ASIC, but it's not impossible. As we can see here, an ASIC miner was actually designed for X11 to mine Dash. So another idea was to periodically switch the mining puzzle. Right? So you can go from SHA-1 to SHA-3 to script, and that way people are going to be at a disadvantage because they won't be able to mine one hash function. But consider this. If it's on a six-month schedule, for example, companies that sell ASICs are going to be able to sell ASICs right before that new hashing algorithm is going to be implemented. That means that all you have to do is produce new ASICs or use old ones or just switch your hardware. So this also is not viable. It's easy to work around and it actually has not been implemented. So Mike Hearn, a Bitcoin core developer, said that there's really no such thing as an ASIC resistant algorithm. And the reason for this is quite clear. If your computer can do something, if your hardware can do something at a certain speed, it's almost certain that there's another piece of hardware out there that can do it better than yours. So another concept was proof of useful work. So currently we use SHA-256, but no one benefits from all of the nonces that are put into the hash function or all of the almost block headers that we get out. So instead we could repurpose this computational power towards these specific goals, like searching for large primes, finding aliens, simulating proteins at the atomic level, or generating predictive climate models. So this is, the, uh, this is one issue when it comes to proof of useful work, in that we see very quickly that it doesn't really work. First and foremost, there is a fixed amount of data that we can provide to miners. So if that data runs out, for example, SETI at home, there's radio telescope data that has not been analyzed that they want analyzed. So if miners are analyzing all this information and we very quickly see that we run out of data, then there's no problem left to solve and that in itself is a problem. So we're missing an inexhaustible puzzle space. Potential solutions are also not very, are not necessarily equally likely. We don't know that there's one section of data that is not, that yields the exact same amount of solutions as another set provided that you put in the same computational effort. You could just get very lucky, lucky a lot of times, meaning that we're missing an equiprobable solution space. And in addition, you cannot rely on a central entity to delegate tasks. If that central entity has some kind of agenda, for example, that they want to force people to mine harder, they could set up an easy task, have a lot of manipulated data and then suddenly make it such that finding a solution is very hard and then start selling ASICs to mine their specific data meaning that essentially they get profit out of that. So we don't necessarily know that essentially again centralization is very much against Bitcoin's philosophy so we're missing that decentralized algorithmically generated problem because 
An algorithm does not have an agenda. Proof of storage is another concept that people were considering. Right, so imagine that you have some large file and it's the size of several hundred petabytes and you want to store this file somehow but you can't store it all on your own. So what you can do is have a bunch of miners say that they're going to store it for you. So it's something that's obviously important, public, and need a replication because people are storing your data. You don't want them to store data that's supposed to be private. So for example, experimental, experimental data from the Large Hadron Collider could be distributed in this way. So what you do is store some files in blocks and this will be in a Merkle tree upon which the network agrees on. From there, each miner is going to have a certain public key and based on their public key, store a subset of blocks from within the tree in or on their computer and they'll continuously hash the consensus information with the nonce in order to pick blocks in their subset. So let's say that they are just given this block, this block, this block, and this block. They choose some nonce and then that nonce, once it's chosen, is going to, through an algorithm, select certain blocks from, with uh, a subset of blocks from their subset of the tree. And what you have to do is prove that that nonce, when hashed with the block, when hashed with the block headers of that subset, is going to produce a value that is less than some target value. That's where the proof of work comes in. And that's also where the proof of storage comes in. In order to continuously hash a nonce with some subset of blocks chosen at random from your pool, you have to continuously pull up that information. Therefore, it's much more efficient to, to have it stored than to uh, have it stored remotely or not have it stored at all. So if the server wants to challenge the client as to whether or not they do indeed have all this information stored on their uh, device, then they can choose a random block. Let's say they choose this block right here. They find the index, or they choose an index, and that block happens to be that index. They send the header to the client and say, hey, give me the index for this block. Now, if the client has all the information stored, it's very easy to pull up the corresponding index. However, if the client does not have the information stored, it's difficult to say that for this index, you have this certain block header. So that's how the server can continuously check that the client is holding that information for them. Right, so there are some drawbacks to proof of storage in that it's hard to find the large file that needs to be stored in this way. It's difficult to change the difficulty. And in addition, it's hard to modify the file once everyone has downloaded it. Right? If 100,000 people have subsets of your block and then you want to say, hey, can we change this part of the, of the file? Then you have to ensure that those people have changed the file, which is very difficult to confirm. And last but not least, merge mining is uh, one way to deter altcoins from being destroyed. Now, how many, familiar, how many people are familiar with what an altcoin is? Show of hands. So an altcoin is any coin other than Bitcoin. And there are quite a few altcoins, like Litecoin and Dogecoin, that are strictly forks of Bitcoin. So the issue with altcoins is that there are, there's hardly the amount of computing power that is going into altcoins as compared to Bitcoin. So altcoins are very vulnerable, and it's easy to attack altcoins because there's no one securing the network. And the difficulty of getting people to secure your network is that they'd have to turn their hash rate away from, block, from Bitcoin. And so if you want people to secure your network, they're going to lose profits. They have to trust your altcoin and be willing to lose profit from mining Bitcoin in order to mine your altcoin. And that's unlikely. So in order to make it more profitable, you'd have to convince them to mine your altcoin. So when the altcoins are in their development stage, there's this thing that often happens which is called altcoin infanticide. And this means that someone in the Bitcoin uh, network who has a lot of hash rate, or ha who, for example, is leading a mining pool, can easily destroy your coin because it has nothing to secure it. For example, in 2012, uh, Allegis mining pool operator Luke Jr. actually attacked Coilcoin. He believed it was a scam, and some people agreed, but very few agreed with his philosophy of attacking the actual altcoin. So what he did was he reversed multiple days worth of transactions and he mined a long chain of empty blocks, essentially rendering the altcoin useless. And he could do this because his hash rate of his pool was far greater than the hash rate of the altcoin at the time. <clears throat> so the way to solve this is through merge mining. Essentially, it's mining for both Bitcoin 
and the altcoin, and it requires no additional cost. So what you do is you create blocks with transactions from both Bitcoin and altcoin. So you have to design your altcoin in such a way that it is actually uh, designed to be able to do merge mining. The Bitcoin blockchain is not changing at all, but the altcoin blockchain is specifically tailored to merge mine. <clears throat> so the question is, well, if it's easy to design an altcoin such that it can contain Bitcoin information, how do you, do the, how do you save altcoin information in the Bitcoin blockchain? So think back to that Coinbase transaction. Right, that's the block reward. That's because those uh, that Bitcoin is being produced. There is no signature that needs to be given, so that script sig field is typically left empty. And what you can do is fill that and fill that field with whatever kind of information you want. So what you can do is fill that information with a summary of the altcoin transactions. Right. So that summary can be a Merkle root of the altcoin transactions, and other Bitcoin clients aren't going to care. They're not going to say, hey, you stuck a Merkle root in this, uh, you know, no one cares that you're sticking a little bit of extra information in this Coinbase script, uh, script sig parameter. So Bitcoin miners can reap Bitcoin and altcoin rewards because they can produce altcoin. Once they find valid altcoin blocks, they can also find valid Bitcoin blocks and then they can get rewards from both. And it takes no additional cost because they can set up the puzzle such that the same nonce is valid for both the altcoin block and the Bitcoin block. So let's, yes. So, uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? Uh, who makes the puzzles in terms of for the altcoin? Oh, so the puzzle, again, is just SHA-256. It's finding some nonce that produces a hash less than a certain target. So that's the puzzle. Uh, did that answer your question? Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at this diagram. So we see here that we have Bitcoin blocks and we have altcoin blocks. These are two parallel chains and they are not being directly merged with each other. Keep in mind that the Bitcoin blockchain is not being affected by all, at all by... The, it does not need to be tailored in any way to support the altcoin. So if people are mining Bitcoin and altcoin, there will be occasional blocks with pointers to the altcoin blockchain because this block contains in its Coinbase parameter, the Merkle root of altcoin transactions. And the altcoin blocks, as their block header, are going to contain a hash of the altcoin transactions, the Bitcoin block header, and some nonce. So essentially, the, uh, the puzzle becomes the same. So every now and then, you'll have some near blocks, which meet the altcoin's difficulty, but not necessarily the, the Bitcoin blockchain's difficulty. So keep in mind that altcoins, because they're new, because people don't necessarily trust them, are going to have a lower difficulty because they want more people to mine, they want more people to secure it, they want people to get rewards more easily. So it should be less difficult so that they don't deter people from mining altcoins. So because of this, you can, very, you can sometimes find a nonce that works for an altcoin blockchain, but not for the Bitcoin blockchain. So what you do is you instead propagate this near block in the altcoin block and then continue on your way. And occasionally you'll have certain blocks that contain both the Bitcoin and the altcoin transactions. So by this process, you're able to help secure the network because you provide hash power to the altcoin. And you ensure that the likelihood of it being destroyed of this altcoin infanticide happening is much lower. So as a bonus, we can talk about SHA-256. So the design actually came from the NSA. This in itself made some people skeptical. They thought the government might be interfering with, uh, you know, might be designing something for which they have a back door. So some people are still skeptical about that. SHA-256, people ask if it will remain secure in the era of quantum computing. So if a quantum computer can, you know, have a much higher amount of hashes per second, it's possible that this is not necessarily going to be able to sustain itself against the quantum computing era. So the question is how Bitcoin conservatives are going to decide. Are they going to want to switch to an algorithm that is more quantum resistant, or are they going to want to stick with SHA-256? Right, so the way that it works is that SHA-256 maintains 256 bits of state. So these 256 bits of state are divided into eight words that are each of 32 bit state. So if you put in a message, which can, which can be of any length, that message is then padded until it's of a length of some multiple of 512 bits. And then from there, it's split up into individual messages, 
And for each of those messages that are 512 bits, or that are, uh, yeah, 512 bits, are, they're split into smaller messages, which then go through this long chain of tweaks, for, uh, bitwise tweaks, of addition. Now keep in mind one note, this is from the t Princeton textbook, but I believe that the Princeton textbook actually made a mistake. Here it says addition mod 32, but it should be addition that's mod 2 to the 32nd. So the SHA-256 function goes through 64 different iterations of this in order to produce a new hash. So after all this computation, then you go from one message to another. And all this randomized, well not necessarily randomized, but seemingly random, unpredictable computation is what makes it very difficult for people to predict you know, what a certain hash is going to, uh, what hash, uh, what input goes to what output and vice versa. So does anyone have any questions about any parts of the lecture, about uh, any topics that we've discussed? Any questions about anything in general from past lectures?